Mr. Speaker, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Of course, we're six feet apart, and so that's why we were, are without our masks, just so the public can know that. Sir, 28 years ago, you entered the parliamentary chambers. Uh, you said that that was a feeling of majesty uh, for you. Did you miss it when you were taking the oath of office as Speaker? Yes, I missed it when I was taking the oath of office. It's um, majesty, yes. It's history, the evolution of Westminster parliamentary democracy goes back centuries and it was a struggle between the common people and the king. And to see all of that play out today, where colonies fought for independence too and self-government, and to see now the people of a country electing their own representative to govern uh, the country and going into the chambers where it started, where it began, it is majestic. So you said in, in your opening remarks to the parliament that uh, you want to see it work effectively. How do you suppose that will work out in this parliament? We can be very effective if we stay within our rules, if we also have respect for each other and exercise a great amount of civility. Us being on different sides and in the middle doesn't mean that we cannot be civil to each other. All of us have one purpose, and that is the upliftment of humanity, and in particular, Guyanese. Speakers are usually not ones who speak a lot or who talk a lot beyond the, the chamber. Are you going to be a bit different? That image of speaker is an old image. Speakers in democracies have become vibrant. They represent and is at the pinnacle of the democratic process. And they ought to be. And they have to be able to speak, be accessible, but also remain impartial and fair because you're adjudicating among the representatives of the people. Is it going to be hard to divorce your political hat from this role? It's very easy to be a person who, one, be fair, impartial, apply the rules evenly and fairly, and be just to all sides. But sir, you, you have been in politics for 40 years. You said it was when you went to Third and Cross Streets in Alexander Village to give your, your first uh, speech. You've come through the, the PNC. You were a TUF leader in the House. I didn't come through the PNC, sorry. No, I, I, <laughs> met, I met you lived through those years. Uh, then you were TUF leader in the House. Then you transitioned to becoming a minister under the, the PPP. I just wanted to ask you about the process that unfolded five months, the five months after the elections. How, how did that affect you? It was mentally taxing to see that this country went through such trauma in the early 60s. And I will tell you, I was physically sitting in then Rio cinema in our boys town when a bomb was thrown in. That venue there, that location is now Masjid Al Najam. What year was this? And that was 1964, July, I think it was. I remember the name of the person who got killed, Betty Moon, because her family and I, we're from, from our boy's son, still stay in touch. So I've passed through that. Then we passed through the PNC regime and all those rigged elections. And to see that. This is the third time you have to go through it. What my parents experienced, what I experienced, and now our children and grandchildren have to go through the same trauma. It was mentally taxing. It was mentally taxing. Of course, you would have some of those very PNC people in Parliament. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand how you would not allow, how you felt at that time to influence the work that you do? That's a fair question people might, might ask of you. It's a fair question, but every person who sits in parliament has been democratically elected and represent a constituency through the democratic process. And whether you sit in parliament as an elected representative or a citizen of this country, everyone deserves the same respect, the same fairness, and more particularly, 
the opportunity to freely express their views. And the first time that you sat on that chair, you had the parliamentary opposition, minus Mr. Schumann, walk out of the House. Uh, do you hope to have less of that? I trust that we could have much more understanding and um, we could have much more cooperation. Walking out is a political tool that parties use. And I can't say I expect to see much or less, but politicians would use the tools that are legally available to them in order to press their case and to make their statements. I know we sat in a parliament uh, for many years where I was the sole member of the opposition, I think for two years, when we were meeting at the Ocean View Convention Center. So they say experience teaches wisdom and having served from 1992 in Parliament, except for five years, I have quite a bit of parliamentary experiences under my belt. Were you surprised that you were chosen for this role? I was extremely surprised. I was, I never expected that I would be chosen for this. I would receive the nomination. I'm really deeply honored by those who have proposed, nominated and elected me. Neil, I've always said to my family, at 55, I would bow out of politics because I, I entered politics very early. And I told them, at 55, I'd bow out. And, um, but what I, saw, what I saw happening, I said, I have to continue to be involved. And I, I, I worked hard, but never expected this. And it, it is truly a great honor to be serving as speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've, I've been hearing a criticism, and it may be, uh, you know, it may be something because I'm thinking back to the other speakers. All of them had a legal background. That's not something that you, you come with a legal education. How do you respond to that? Uh, simple. To become a lawyer, you do three years of law school. You do two years at the Council of Legal Education, five years. And then you may have some experiences. I've been a lawmaker for 23 years. I think I got two PhD in making law. <laughs> <laughs> very well, thank you, we'll leave it there. Thank you very, very much.